Memoirs of a Revolutionary by Victor Serge. This is part two of chapter three. The news from the other fronts was so bad that Lenin was reluctant to sacrifice the last available forces in the defense of a doomed city. Trotsky thought otherwise. The Politburo entrusted him with the final initiative. He arrived at almost the last moment and his presence instantly changed the atmosphere at Smolny, as it did when he visited headquarters in the Peter Paul Fortress, whose commander was Avrov. He must have been a non-commissioned officer and former worker. I saw him laboring away every day, his tunic unbuttoned at, at the top, his square face deeply lined, his eyes heavily lidded. He would listen vacantly to what you said, then a little light would appear in his ash gray eyes, and he would reply emphatically, I'll give orders right now, but then a moment later he would add furiously, but I don't know if they can be carried out. Trotsky arrived with his train, that famous train which had been speeding to and fro along the different fronts since the day in the previous year when its engineers, orderlies, typists, and military experts had together with Trotsky, Ivan Smirnov, and Rosengoltz, retrieved a hopeless situation by winning the battle of Sv Sv <laughs> Sviesk. The train of the Revolutionary War Council's president contained excellent motor cars, a liaison staff, a court of justice, a print shop for propaganda, sanitary squads, and specialists in engineering, provisioning, street fighting, and artillery, all of them men picked in battle, all self-confident, all bound together by friendship and trust, all kept to a strict, vigorous discipline by a leader they admired, all dressed in black leather, red stars on their peaked caps, all exhaling energy. It was a nucleus of resolute and efficiently serviced organizers who hastened wherever danger demanded their presence. They took everything in hand, meticulously and passionately. It was magical. Trotsky kept saying, It is impossible for a little army of 15,000 ex-officers to master a working-class capital of 700,000 inhabitants. He had posters put up proclaiming that the city would, would defend itself on its own ground, that from now on this was the best strategic method that the small white army would be lost in the labyrinth of fortified streets and there meet its grave. In contrast to this determination to win, a French communist, René Marchand, who had just seen Lenin, told me of Vladimir Illich's remark, matter of fact and mischievous as usual. Oh well, we shall have to go underground all over again. Or was this really so much of a contrast? I caught glimpses of Trotsky in the street, then at a packed meeting of the Soviet, where he announced the arrival of a division of Bashkirian cavalry that we would launch mercilessly against Finland in fin if Finland budged an inch. It depended on Finland to deal us the death blow. This was an extremely skillful threat, which caused, caused a chill of terror to pass over Helsinki. This session of the Soviet took place beneath the lofty white columns of the Torrid Palace in the amphitheater of the old Imperial Duma. Trotsky was all tension and energy. He was, besides, an orator of unique quality whose metallic voice projected a great distance, ejaculating its short sentences that were often sardonic and always infused with a truly spontaneous passion. The decision to fight to the death was taken enthusiastically, and the whole amphitheater raised a song of immense power. I reflected that the psalms sung by Cromwell's roundheads before their decisive battles must have sounded no different a tone. Capable regiments of infantry recalled from the Polish front now marched through the city to take up their positions in the suburbs. The Bashkirian cavalry, mounted on small, long-haired horses, from the steeps, rode in line along the streets. These horsemen, figures from a distant past, swarthy and wearing black sheepskin caps, 
sang their old songs in guttural voices to an accompaniment of shrill whistling. Sometimes a thin, bespectacled, bespectacled intellectual would ride at their head. He was destined to become the author Constantin Fedin. They fought rarely and deplorably, but that was unimportant. Convoys of provisions extorted God knows how from God knows where were arriving too. This was the most efficient weapon. It was rumored that the whites had tanks. Trotsky had it proclaimed that the infantry was well able to knock tanks out. Certain mysterious but ingenious agitators spread the rumor, which may even have been true, that Yudinich's tanks were made of painted wood. The city was dotted with veritable fortresses. Lines of cannon occupied the streets. Material from the underground drainage system was used to build these fortifications, the big pipes from the sewers being particularly handy. The anarchists were mobilized for the work of defense. Kolob Kolobushkin, once a prison at Schlüsselburg, was their leading light. The party gave them arms, and they had a black headquarters and devastated apartment belonging to a dentist who had fled. There, disorder and comradeship presided above all. There also presided the smile of a fair-haired and intensely charming girl who came from the Ukraine with reports of frightful massacres and the latest news of Magno. Tvetkova was to die shortly of typhus. She brought a real beam of sunshine into that group of inflamed and embittered men. It was they who, on the night of the worst danger, occupied the printing works of Pravda, the Bolshevik paper that they hated, ready to defend it to the death. They discovered two whites in their midst, armed with hand grenades, and about to blow them up. What were they to do? They locked them in a room and looked at each other in embarrassment. We are jailers, just like the Cheka. They despised the Cheka with all their hearts. A proposal to shoot these enemy spies was rejected with horror. What, us to be execu executioners? Finally, my friend Kol Kolobushkin, the ex-convict, at the time one of the organizers of the Republic's fuel supply, was charged with, with taking them to the Peter Paul Fortress. This was a poor compromise, since there the Cheka would shoot them within the hour. Once in the Black Guard's motor car, Kolobushkin, who in the past had made this very same journey himself between a couple of Tsarist gendarmes, saw their trapped faces and remembered the days of his youth. He stopped the car and impulsively told them, Hop it, you bastards. Afterwards, he came, relieved but vexed, to tell me about those unbearable moments. I was a fool, wasn't I? He asked me. But you know, all the same, I'm glad of it. Petrograd was saved on October 21st at the Battle of the Polkova Heights, some 10 miles, miles south of the half-encircled city. Defeat was transformed into a victory so complete that Yudinich's troops rolled back in disorder towards the Estonian frontier. There, the Estonians blocked their path. The white army that had failed to capture Petrograd perished miserably. About 300 workers who had hastened from Schlüsselburg had also blocked the whites at one critical moment before being mown down by a body of officers who marched into the fray as though on parade. Mazen Lichtenstadt's last message reached me after the battle. It was a letter that he asked me to send on to his wife. It said, he who sends men to their deaths must see that he himself gets killed. It was an extraordinary fact, and one that proves how deep-rooted in its causes, both social and psychological, they amount to the same. Our resilience was, but the same apparent miracle was achieved simultaneously on all the fronts of the Civil War, although at the end of October and the beginning of November the situation seemed equally hopeless everywhere. During the battle near Polkova, the white army of General Denikin was beaten not far from Vor Voronezh by the Red Cavalry, 
hastily assembled by Trotsky and commanded by a former NCO named Budyeni. On November 14th, Admiral Kolchak, the supreme head, lost Ornsk, his capital in western Siberia. Salvation had come. The white disaster was the price of two cardinal errors, their failure to have the intelligence and courage to carry out agrarian reform in the territories they wrested from the revolution, and their reinstatement everywhere of the ancient trinity of generals, high clergy, and landlords. A boundless confidence returned to us. I remembered what Mazin said, in the worst days of our famine, when we saw old folk collapsing in the street, some holding out a little tin saucepan in their emaciated fingers. All the same, he told me, we are the greatest power in the world. Alone we are bringing the world a few principal, principles of justice and the rational organization of work. Alone in all this war-sick Europe where nobody wants to fight anymore, we are able to form new armies, and tomorrow we shall be able to wage wars that are truly just. Their house of cards must fall. The longer it lasts, the more misery and bloodshed it will cost. By the house of cards, we meant the Versailles Treaty that had just been signed in June 1919. Together with Maxim Gorky, P.E. Shegelev, the historian, and no Novorusky, the veteran of the People's Will Party, we founded the first museum of the revolution. Zinoviev had a large part of the Winter Palace allotted to us. Like most of the party leaders, he really wanted to make it a museum for Bolshevik propaganda, but anxious to have the support of the revolutionary intellectuals, and at least the appearance of a scientific concern, he allowed us to make an honest beginning. I continued to investigate the Okhrana archives. The frightful mass of documents that I found there afforded a unique kind of psychological interest but the practical bearing of my research was perhaps even greater. For the first time, the entire mechanism of an authoritarian empire's police repression had fallen into the hands of revolutionaries. Thorough study of this material could furnish the militants of other countries with useful clues. Despite our enthusiasm and our sense of right, we were not certain that one day reaction would not drive us back. We were indeed more or less convinced to the contrary. It was a generally accepted thesis, which Lenin stated several times, that Russia, agricultural and backward from an industrial standpoint as it was, could not create a lasting socialist system for itself by its own efforts, and that consequently we should be overcome sooner or later unless the European Revolution, or at the very least the Socialist Revolution in Central Europe, assured socialism of a broader and more viable base. Finally, we knew that former police spies were at work among us, most of them ready to resume their services to the counter-revolution. This implied grave danger for us. In the first days of the March 1917 revolution, the Petrograd Palace of Justice had gone up in flames. We knew that the destruction of its archives, its anthro Pometric cards and collection of secrets have been the work both of the criminal underground, which was interested in destroying these documents, and of police agents. At Kronstadt, a revolutionary who was also a police spy, had carried off the security archives and burnt them. Vyokrana's secret collection contained between 30,000 and 40,000 records of agents, agents provocateurs active over the last 20 years. By devoting ourselves to a simple calculation of the probabilities of decease and various other eliminations, and taking account of the, the 3,000 or so that had been unmasked through the patient work of the archiv archiv archivists, we estimated that several thousand former secret agents were still active in the revolution. At least 5,000, according to the historian Shegelev who told me of the following incident which happened in a town on the Volga. A commission composed of known members of the different parties of the extreme left and left in general was interrogating the leading officials of the imperial police on this question of provocation. The head of the political police apologized for not being able to name two of his ex-agents since they were members of this very commission. 
He would rather that these gentlemen obeyed the voice of their conscience and identified themselves. And two of the revolutionaries stood up in confusion. The old secret agents, all of them initi initiates, initiates into the political life, could, prevent, could pretend to be seasoned revolutionaries. Since they were not at all troubled by scruples, they found it to their own advantage to rally to the ruling to the ruling party, in which it was easy for them to obtain good positions. Consequently, they played a certain role in the system. We guess that some of them were under orders to select and follow the worst possible policies, engineering excesses, and sowing discredit. It was extremely hard to unmask them. As a rule, the records were classified under pseudonyms and assiduous cross-checking was necessary before identification could be established. For example, in 1912, in the revolutionary organizations of Moscow, which were by no means mass organizations, there were 55 police agents, 17 social revolutionaries, 20 Men Menshevik or Bolshevik social democrats, three anarchists, 11 students, and several liberals. In the same period, the leader of the Bolshevik faction, fraction in the Duma and spokesman for Lenin was a police spy, Malinovsky. The head of the Social Revolutionary Party's terrorist organization, a member of its central committee, was an Okhrana agent. Evno Azev, this from 1903 to 1908, at the time of the most sensational assassinations. Somewhere around 1930, to cut a long story short, several former police agents were finally unmasked among the Leningrad leadership. I found an extraordinary file, one in need of no deciphering. Number 378, Julia Orestovna Sorova, wife of a Bolshevik deputy in the Second Imperial Duma. He was a fine militant who had been shot in 1918 at Chita. The catalog of Sorova's services, <coughs> listed in a report to the minister, revealed that she had betrayed caches of army of arms and literature. Had Rikov, Kamenev, and many others arrested and spied for a great length of time on the party committees. <coughs> Having at last fallen under suspicion, <coughs> and been sent packing, she wrote in February 1917, a few weeks before um, the, fall in, the fall of the autocracy to the head of the secret police asking to be reemployed in view of the great events that are drawing near. She got married again to a Bolshevik worker and so was once again in a position to carry on her activities. The letters revealed a woman of practical intelligence, zealous, greedy for money, and perhaps hysterical. One evening, in a circle of friends having tea, we discussed this particular psychological case. An old woman militant stood up, flabbergasted. Sorova? But I just met her in town. She's actually married again to a comrade in the Viberg district. Sorova was arrested and shot. The psychology of the police spy was usually double-natured. Gorky showed me a letter that one of them, still at large, had written to him. The gist of it ran. I hated myself, but I knew that my little betrayals would not stop the revolution from marching on. The Okhrana's instructions advised its minions to seek out those revolutionaries who were faint-hearted, embittered, or disappointed, to make use of personal rivalries and to assist the advancement of skillful agents by eliminating the most talented militants. The old barrister, Kozlovsky, who had been the first People's Commissar for Justice, told me his impressions of Malinovsky. The former Bolshevik leader in the Duma returned to Russia from Germany in 1918, even after his unmasking, and presenting himself at Smolny, asked to be arrested. Malinovsky? Don't know the name, replied the commander of the guard. Go and explain yourself to the party committee. Kozlovsky interrogated him. 
Malinovsky said that he could not live outside the revolution. I have been a double dealer despite my own best feelings. I want to be shot. He maintained this attitude in front of the Revolutionary Tribunal. Krylenko ruthlessly demanded sentence. The adventurer is playing his last card, and Malinovsky was shot in the gardens of the Kremlin. Many indications led me to believe that he was absolutely sincere and that if he had been allowed to live, he would have served as faithfully as the others. But what confidence could the others have in him? <clears throat> Gorky tried to save the lives of the police spies, who in his eyes were the repositories of a unique social and psychological experience. These men are a sort of monster, worthy of preservation for research. He used the same arguments to defend the lives of high officials in the Tsarist political police. I remember a conversation on these matters that wandered onto the question of the necessity for applying the death penalty to children. The Soviet leaders were concerned at the scale of juvenile crime. Certain, certain children, more or less abandoned, formed actual gangs. These were put into children's homes, where they still starved. Then they would abscond and resume a life of crime. Olga, a pretty little girl of 14, had several child murders and several absconsions on her record. She organized burglaries in apartments where a child had been left alone by the parents. She would talk to it through the door, win its confidence, and get it to open the door to her. What could be done with her? Gorky argued for the establishment of colonies for child criminals in the north, where life is rough and adventure always at hand. I do not know what became of the idea. We put together a fairly complete documentary picture of the activities of the Okrana's secret service abroad. It had agents among immigrants everywhere, as well as among the journalists and politicians of many countries. The senior official, Rakovsky, on a tour of duty in Paris at the time of the Franco-Russian alliance, made the well-known com comment about the sordid venality of the French press. We also found in the archives meticulous histories of the revolutionary parties, written by chiefs of police. These have since been published, poured over in the Malachite halls of the Winter Palace, whose windows overlooked the Peter Paul Fortress, a very our very own Bastille. These extraordinary tools of a police state's machinery of repression should give pause for thought. They reveal the ultimate powerlessness of repression when it seeks to impede the development of a historical necessity and to defend a regime that is against the needs of society. However powerfully equipped it might be, all it can achieve is to add to the suffering by gaining a little time. The Civil War seemed about to end. General Denikin's National Army was in flight across the Ukraine. In Siberia, Admiral Kolchak's forces, encircled by the Red Partisans, were in retreat. The idea of a normalization of life was exerting increasing pressure within the party. Ryazanov tirelessly demanded the abolition of the death penalty. The Cheka was unpopular. In the middle of January 1920, Zerzinski, with the approval of Lenin and Trotsky, recommended the abolition of the death sentence throughout the country, except in districts where there were military operations. On January 17th, the decree was passed by the government and signed by Lenin as president of the Council of People's Commissars. For several days, the prisons, crammed with suspects, had been living in tense expectation. They knew immediately of the tremendous good news, the end of the terror. The decree had still not appeared in the newspapers. In the 18th or the 19th, some of the comrades at Smolny told me in hushed voices of the tragedy of the preceding night. No one mentioned it openly. While the newspapers were printed, the decree, the Petrograd Chekas were liquidating their stock. Cartload after cartload of suspects had been driven outside the city during the night, and then shot heap upon heap. How many? In Petrograd, between 150 and 200. In Moscow, it was said between 200 and 300. In the dawn of the days that followed, the families of the massacred victims came to search that ghastly, freshly dug ground, looking for any relics, such as buttons or scraps of stocking, that could be gathered there. 
the Czechists had presented the government with a feat accompli. Much later, I became personally acquainted with one of those responsible for the Petrograd massacre. I will call him Leon Leonidov. We thought, he told me, that if the people's commissars were getting converted to humanitarianism, that was their business. Our business was to crush the counter-revolution forever, and they could shoot us afterwards if they felt like it. It was a frightful and tragic example of occupational psychosis. Leonidov, when I knew him, was in any case definitely half insane. In all likelihood, the incorrigible counter-revolutionaries were only a very minute percentage of the victims. A few months later, during my wife's confinement, I had a conversation with a sick woman who had just given birth to a stillborn child. Her husband, the engineer Trotsky, or Troitsky, had been shot during that abominable night. He was a former social revolutionary who had taken part in the 1905 revolution and had been imprisoned for speculation, that is, for a single purchase of sugar on the black market. I verified these facts. Even at Smolny, this drama was shrouded in utter mystery. However, it redounded to the regime's profound discredit. It was becoming clear to me and to others that the suppression of the Cheka and the reintroduction of regular tribunals and rights of defense were from now on preconditions for the revolution's own safety. But we could do absolutely nothing. The Politburo then composed, if I am not mistaken, of Lenin, Trotsky, Zinoviev, Kamenev, Rikov, and Bukharin deliberated the question without daring to answer it, being itself, I have no doubt, the victim of a certain psychosis born of fear and ruthless authority. Against the party, the anarchists were right when they'd inscribed on their black banners, there's no worse poison than power, meaning absolute power. From now on, the psychosis of absolute power was to captivate the great majority of the leadership, especially at the lower levels. I could give countless examples. It was a producer of the inferiority complex of the exploited, the enslaved, the humiliated of the past, of the autocracy's tradition, unwittingly reproduced at each stage, of the unconscious grudges of former convicts and gallows birds of the imperial prisons of the destruction of human kindness by the war and the civil war, of fear and of the decision to fight to the death. These feelings were inflamed by the atrocities of the white terror. At Perm, Admirable Kolchak had 4,000 workers killed out of a population of 55,000. In Finland, the reaction had massacred between 15,000 and 17,000. Hold on. In Finland, the reaction had massacred between 15,000 and 17,000 Reds. Just in the small town of Proskurov, several thousand Jews had been slaughtered. This news, these accounts, these mind-boggling statistics were a daily diet. Otto Corvin and then his friends had just been hanged in Budapest before an excited crowd of society people. However, I remain convinced that that the, social, the socialist revolution would nevertheless have been much stronger and clearer if those who held supreme power had persevered in defending and applying a principle of humanity towards the defeated enemy with as much energy as they did in overcoming him. I know they had an inkling of this, but did not have the will to carry it out. Carry it out. I know the greatness of these men, but they who belong to the future were in this respect prisoners of the past. The spring of 1920 opened with a victory, the capture of Archangel, now evacuated by the British, and then all at once the outlook changed. Once again there was peril, immediate and mortal. The Polish invasion. In the files of the Okrana, I had photographs of Pilsudski, condemned years ago for plotting against the Tsar's life. I met a doctor who had attended Polsutsky in a St. Petersburg hospital, where he had pretended to be mad with a rare skill in order to get away. Himself a revolutionary and a terrorist, he was now hurling his legions against us. 
A wave of anger and enthusiasm rose against him. Brusilov and Pol Polivanov, old Tsar's generals who by some accident had escaped execution, volunteered to fight in response to an appeal by Trotsky. I saw Gorky burst into tears on a balcony in the Nevsky Prospect, haranguing a battalion off to the front. When will we stop all this killing and bleeding? He would mutter under his bristling mustache. The death penalty was reintroduced, and under the stimulus of defeat, the Chekas were given enlarged powers. The Poles were entering Kiev. Zinoviev kept saying, our salvation lies in the international, and Lenin agreed with him. At the height of the war, the Second Congress of the Communist International was hastily summoned. I worked literally day and night to prepare for it since. Thanks to my knowledge of languages in the Western world, I was practically the only person available to perform a whole host of duties. I met Lansbury, the English pacifists, and John Reed on their arrival. I hit a delegate of Hungarian left communists who were in opposition to Bela Kuhn and in some kind of liaison with Rakovsky. We published the International's periodical in four languages. We sent innumerable secret messages abroad by various adventurous routes. I translated Lenin's messages and also the book that Trotsky had just written in his military train, Terrorism and Communism, which emphasized the necessity for a long dictatorship in the period of transition to socialism for several decades at least. Trotsky's rigid ideas with their schem schematism <laughs> and voluntarism disturbed me a little. Everything was scarce, staff, paper, ink, even bread, as well as facilities for communication. All we received in the way of foreign newspapers were a few copies bought in Helsinki by smugglers who crossed the front lines especially for the purpose. I paid them 100 rubles per copy. On occasion, when one of their number had been killed, they came to ask for extra money, at which we did not demur. In Moscow, organizational activity was proceeding at an equally feverish pace under the supervision of Angelica Balabanova and Bukharin. I met Lenin when he came to Petrograd for the first session of Congress. We had tea together in a small reception room in the Smolny. Yev Dokomov, and Angel Pistana, the delegate from the Spanish CNT, were with me when Lenin came in. He beamed, shaking the hands that were outstretched to him, passing from one salutation to the next. Yev, Yev Dokomov and he embraced one another gaily gazing straightly into each other's eyes, happy as overgrown children. Vladimir Illich was wearing one of his old jackets dating back to his emigration, perhaps brought back from Zurich. I saw it on him in all seasons. Practically bald, his cranium high and bulging, his forehead strong, he had commonplace features. An amazingly fresh and pink face, a little reddish beard, slightly jutting cheekbones, Eyes horizontal, but apparently slanted because of the laughter lines. A grey-green gaze at people, and a surpassing air of geniality and cheerful malice. In the Kremlin, he still occupied a small apartment built for a palace servant. In the recent winter, he, like everyone else, had had no heating. When he went to the barbers, he took his turn, thinking it unseeming, un unseemly for anyone to give way to him. An old housekeeper looked after his rooms and did his mending. He knew that he was the party's foremost brain and recently, in a grave situation, had used no threat worse than that of resigning from the Central Committee so as to appe appeal to the rank and file. He craved a tribune's popularity, stamped with the seal of the masses' approval, devoid of any show or ceremony. His manners and behavior betrayed not the slightest inkling of any taste for authority. What showed through was only the urgency of the devoted technician who wants the work to be done, and done quickly and well. 
Also in evidence was his forthright resolve that the new institutions, weak though they might be to the point of a merely symbolic existence, must nevertheless be respected. On that day, or perhaps the following one, he spoke for several hours at the first formal session of the Congress under the white colonnade of the Torrid Palace. His report dealt with the historical situation consequent upon the Versailles Treaty. Quoting abundantly from Maynard Keynes, Lenin established the insolvency of a Europe carved up arbitrarily by victorious imperialisms and the impossibility of any lengthy endurance by Germany of the burdens that had been so idiotically imposed upon her. He concluded that a new European revolution, which was destined also to involve the colonial peoples of Asia, must be inevitable. He was neither a great orator nor a first-rate lecturer. <clears throat> he employed no rhetoric and sought no demagogical effects. His vocabulary was that of a newspaper article, and his technique included diverse forms of repetition, all with the aim of driving in ideas thoroughly as one drives in a nail. He was never boring on account of his mimic's liveliness and the reasoned conviction which drove him. His customary gestures consisted of raising his hand to underline the importance of what he had said, and then bending towards the audience, smiling and earnest, his palms spread out in an act of demonstration. It is obvious, isn't it? Here is a man of a basic simplicity, talking to you honestly with the sole purpose of convincing you, appealing exclusively to your judgment, to facts and sheer necessity. Facts have hard heads, he was fond of saying. He was the embodiment of plain common sense, so much so that he disappointed the French delegates who are used to impressive parliamentary joustings. When you see Lenin at close quarters, he loses much of his glamour, I was told by one French deputy, an eloquent skeptic positively bursting with witty epigrams. Zinoviev had commissioned Isaac Brodsky to paint a large canvas of this historic session. Brodsky made sketches. Years later, the painter was still working on his canvas, altering the face altering the faces of those present to those of others, to new dubious ones, as the crises and the oppositions modified the composition of the executive of the day. The Comintern's second Congress took up the test of its work in Moscow. The Congress staff and the foreign delegates lived in the Hotel Delavoye, Devore centrally situated at the end of a wide boulevard, one side of which was lined by the white embattled rampart of Kite Gorod. Medieval gateways topped by an ancient turret formed the approach to the nearby Varvarka, where the first of the Romanovs had lived. From there we came out into the Kremlin, a city within a city, every entrance guarded by sentries who checked our passes. There, in the palaces of the old autocracy, in the midst of ancient Byzantine churches, lay the headquarters of the revolution's double arm, the Soviet government and the international. The only city the foreign delegates never got to know, and their incuriosity in this respect disturbed me, was the real living Moscow with its starvation rations, its arrests, its sordid prison episodes, its behind-the-scenes racketeering, sumptuously fed amidst universal misery, although it is true too many rotten eggs turned up at mealtimes, shepherded from museums to model nurseries. The representatives of international socialism seem to react like holiday makers or tourists within our poor republic, flayed and bleeding with the siege. I discovered a novel variety of insensitivity, Marxist insensitivity, Paul Levi, a leading figure in the German Communist Party, an athletic and self-confident figure, told me outright that, for a Marxist, the internal contradictions of the Russian Revolution were nothing to be surprised at. This was doubtless true, except that he was using this general truth as a screen to shut away the sight of immediate fact, which has an importance all its own. Most of the Marxist left, now Bolshevized, adopted this complacent attitude, the words dictatorship of the proletariat functioned as a magical explanation for them, without it ever occurring to them to ask 
where this dictator of a proletariat was, what it thought, felt, and did. The Social Democrats, by contrast, were notable for their critical spirit and for their incomprehension. Among the best of them, I am thinking of the Germans Domig, Crispian, and Dittmann. Their peaceful, bourgeoisified socialist humanism was so offended by the revolution's harsh climate that they were incapable of thinking straight. The anarchist delegates with whom I held many discussions had a healthy revulsion from official truths and the trappings of power and a passionate interest in actual life. But as the adherents of an essentially, essentially emotional approach to theory who were ignorant of political economy and had never faced the problem of power, they found it practically impossible to achieve any theoretical understanding of what was going on. They were excellent comrades, more or less at the stage of the romantic arguments for the universal revolution that the libertarian artisans had managed to frame between 1848 and 1860 before the growth of modern industry and its proletariat. Among them were Angel Pestana of the Barcelona CNT, a watchmaker and a brave popular leader, slender in build, with beautiful dark eyes and a small moustache of the same hue. Armando Borghi of the Italian Union Syndicale, with his fine face, bearded, young, and Mazzini-like, and his fervent but velvety voice. Augustin Succi, red-haired and with an old trooper's face, the delegate from the Swedish and German syndicalists. Le Petit, a sturdy navvy from the French CGT, and Le Libertaire, merry but mistrustful in questioning, who suddenly swore that, in France, the revolution would be made quite differently. Lenin was very anxious to have the support of the best of the anarchists. To tell the truth, outside Russia and perhaps Bulgaria, there were no real communists anywhere in the world. The old schools of revolution and the younger generation that had emerged from the war were both at an infinite distance from the Bolshevik mentality. The bulk of these men were symptomatic of obsolete movements that had been quite outrun by events, combining an abundance of good intentions with a scarcity of talent. The French Socialist Party was represented by Marcel Cachin and L.O. Frossard, both of them highly parliamentary in their approach. Cachin was, as usual, sniffing out the direction of the prevailing wind. Ever mindful of his personal popularity, he was shifting to the left, after having been a supporter of the Sacred Union during the war and a backer on behalf of the French government of Mussolini's jingoist campaigns in Italy. This was in 1916. On their way, Kachin and Frassard had stopped off in Warsaw for talks with the Polish socialists who supported Polsudski's aggression against the revolution. When this became known, Trotsky insisted that they be asked to leave without delay, and we never saw them again. The expulsion of these politicians produced widespread satisfaction. The Paris Committee of the Third International had sent Alfred Rossmer, he of the Ibsenesque surname was a syndicalist, a devoted internationalist, and an old personal friend of Trotsky. Beneath his half-smile, Rossmer incarnated the qualities of vigilance discretion, silence, and dedication. His colleague from the same committee was Raymond Lefebvre, a tall, sharp-featured young man who had carried stretchers at Verdun. A poet and novelist, he had just written his confession of faith as a man home from the trenches, in a luxuriant poetic style. It was entitled Revolution or Death. He spoke for the survivors of a generation now lying buried in communal graves. We quickly became friends. Of the Italians, I remember the veteran Lazari, an upright old man whose feverish voice burned with an undying enthusiasm. Serrati's bearded, myopic, and professorial face. Terracini, a young theoretician with a tall, ascetic forehead, who was fated to spend the best years of his life in jail. After giving the world a few pages of his keen intellect, Bordiga, exuberant and energetic, features blunt hair, thick, black, and bristly, 
a man quivering under his encumbrance of ideas, experiences, and dark forecasts. There was Angelica Balabanova, a slender woman whose delicate, already motherly face was framed in a double braid of black hair. An air of extreme gracefulness encompassed her. Perpetually active, she still hoped for an international that was unconfined, open-hearted, and rather romantic. Rosa Luxemburg's lawyer, Paul Levi, represented the German communists. Domig, Crispian, Dittmann, and another represented Germany's independent Social Democratic Party. Four likable, rather helpless middlemen, good beer drinkers, one could be sure, and conscientious officials in stodgy, established working class organizations. It was obvious at first glance that here were no insurant souls or insurgent souls. Of the British, I met only Galasher, who looked like a stocky prize fighter. From the United States came Freyna, leader to fall under grave suspicion, and John Reed, the eyewitness of the 1917 Bolshevik uprising, whose book on the revolution was already considered authoritative. I had met Reed in Petrograd, whence we had organized his clandestine departure through Finland. The Finns had been sorely tempted to finish him off and had confined him for a while in a death trap of a jail. He had just visited some small townships in the Moscow outskirts and reported what he had seen, a ghost country where only famine was real. He was amazed that Soviet's Soviet production continued despite everything. Reed was tall, forceful, and matter-of-fact, with a cool idealism and a lively intelligence, tinged by humor. Once again, I saw Rakovsky, the head of the Soviet government in a Ukraine that was now prey to hundreds of roving bands. White nationalist, black or anarchist, green and red, bearded and dressed in a soldier's worn uniform, he broke into perfect French while he was on the rostrum. From Bulgaria, Kolarov arrived, huge and somewhat pot-bellied, whose noble and commanding face bore the, sa the stamp of assurance. He blurted out a promise to the Congress that he would take power at home as soon as the International asked him. From Holland there came Wincoop, among others, dark-bearded and long-jawed, apparently aggressive, but destined, as it turned out, for a career of limit limitless servility. From India, by way of Mexico, we had the pockmarked Manab Manabendra Nath Roy, very tall, very handsome, very dark, with very wavy hair. He was accompanied by a statuesque Anglo-Saxon woman who appeared to be naked beneath her flimsy dress. We did not know that in Mexico he had been the target of some unpleasant suspicions. He was fated to become the guiding spirit of the tiny Indian Communist Party, to spend several years in prison, to start activity again, to slander the opposition with nonsensical insults, to be expelled himself, and then to return to grace. But this was all in the distant future. The Russians led the dance and their superiority was so obvious that this was quite legitimate. The only figure in Western socialism that was capable of equaling them, or even perhaps of surpassing them so far as intelligence and the spirit of freedom were concerned, was Rosa Luxemburg, and she had been battered to death with the butt of a revolver in January 1919 by German officers. Apart from Lenin, the Russians consisted of Zinoviev, Bukharin, Rakovsky, who, though Romanian by origin, was as much Russified as he was Frenchified, and Karl Radek, recently released from a Berlin prison in which he had courted death and where Leo J Jogish had been murdered at his side. Trotsky, if he indeed came to the Congress, must have made only rare appearances, for I do not remember having seen him there. He was principally occupied with the state of the fronts, and the Polish front was still ablaze. The work of the Congress centered upon three issues, and also a fourth, which, though even more important, was not touched upon in open session. Lenin was bending every effort to convince the left communists 
Dutch, German, or, like Bordiga, Italian, of the necessity for compromise and participation in electoral and parliamentary politics. He warned of the danger of their becoming revolutionary sects. In his discussion of the national and colonial question, Lenin emphasized the possibility and even necessity of inspiring Soviet-type revolutions in the Asiatic colonial countries. The experience of Russian Turkestan seemed to lend support to his arguments. He was aiming primarily at India and China. He thought that the blow must be directed at these countries in order to weaken British imperialism, which then appeared as the inveterate foe of the Soviet Republic. The Russians had no further hopes for the traditional socialist parties of Europe. They judged that the only possible course was to work for splits that would break with the old reformist and parliamentary leaderships, thereby creating new parties, disciplined and controlled by the executive in Moscow, which would proceed efficiently to the conquest of power. Serrati raised serious objections to the Bolshevik tactic of support for the colonial nationalist movements. Demonstrating the reactionary and disturbing elements in these movements, which might emerge in the, in the future. It was naturally out of the question to listen to him. Bordiga opposed Lenin on, a quest, on questions of organization and general perspective. Without daring to say so, he was afraid of the influence of the Soviet state on the communist parties and the, tem the, and the temptations of compromise, demagogy, and corruption. Above all, he did not believe that a peasant Russia was capable of guiding the inf international working class movements. Beyond doubt, his was one of the most penetrating intellects at the Congress, but only a very tiny group supported him. The Congress made ready for the splitting of the French party at Tours and the Italian party at Leghorn by laying down 21 stringent conditions for the affiliates of the international or rather 22, the 22nd, which is not at all well known, excluded Freemasons. The fourth problem was not on the agenda and no trace of it will ever be found in the published accounts, but I saw it discussed with considerable heat by Lenin. In a gathering of foreign delegates in a small room just off the grand gold paneled hall of the Imperial Palace. A throne had been bundled away here and next to this useless piece of furniture, a map of the Polish front was displayed on the wall. The rattle of typewriters filled the air. Lenin, jacketed, briefcase under arm, delegates and typists all around him, was giving his views on the march of Tukhachevsky's army on Warsaw. He was in excellent spirits and confident of victory. Karl Radek, thin, monkey-like, sardonic, and droll, hitched up his oversized trousers, which were always slipping down over his hips, and added, We shall be ripping up the Versailles Treaty with our bayonets. A little later, we were, just, we were to discover that Tukhachevsky was complaining about the exhaustion of his troops and the lengthening of his lines of communication, that Trotsky considered the offensive to be too rushed and risky in those circumstances, that Lenin had forced the attack to a certain extent by sending Rakovsky and Smilga as political commissars to accompany to Kachevsky, and that it would, despite everything, probably have succeeded if Stalin and Budyeni had provided support instead of marching on Lyov to assure themselves of a personal, a personal victory. Defeat came at Warsaw, quite suddenly, just at the moment when the fall of the Polish capital was actually being announced. Apart from, the, from some students and a very few workers, the peasantry and proletariat of Poland had not welcomed the Red Army. I remained convinced that the Russians had made a psychological error by including Zerzinski, the man of the terror, side by side with Markluski on the Revolutionary Committee that was to govern Poland. I declared that, far from firing the polar popular enthusiasm, the name of Zerzinski would freeze it all together. That is just what happened. Once more, the westward expansion of the revolution had failed. 
There was no alternative for the Bolsheviks but to turn east. Hastily, the Congress of the Oppressed Nationalities of the East was convened at Baku. As soon as the Comintern Congress was over, Zinoviev, Radek, Rosmer, John Reed, and Bela Kuhn went off to Baku in a special train, whose defense, since they were to pass through perilous country, and command were entrusted to their friend Yakov Blumkin. I shall say more of Blumkin later, a propos of his frightful death. At Baku, Enver Pasha put in a sensational appearance. A whole hall full of Orientals broke into shouts with scimitars and yateg bands? Yateg hands? Yep, I don't Yateg bands brandished aloft, death to imperialism. All the same genuine understanding with the Islamic world, swept as it was by its own national and religious aspirations, was still difficult. Enver Pasha aimed at the creation of an Islamic state in Central Asia. He was to be killed in a battle against the Red Cavalry two years later. Returning home from this remarkable trip, John Reed took a, a great bite out of a watermelon he had bought in a picturesque Dagestan market. As a result, he died from typhoid. The Moscow Congress is associated for me with more than one such loss. Before I write of these deaths, I would like to say more of the circumstances of the time. My own experience was probably unique since in this period I maintained a staunch openness in my approach, being in daily contact with official circles, ordinary folk, and the revolution's persecuted dissenters. Throughout the Petrograd celebrations, I was concerned with the fate of Volin, though some friends and myself had managed to save his life for the first, for the time being. Volin, whose real name was Boris Eichenbaum, was a working class intellectual who had been one of the founders of the 1905 St. Petersburg Soviet. He had returned from America in 1917 to lead the Russian anarchist movement. He had joined Makhno's Ukrainian army of insurgent peasants, fought the whites, resisted the reds, and tried to organize a free peasants federation in the region of Goulier Polie, or Goulier Polie. After he had caught typhus, he was captured by the Red Army in the course of a black retreat. We were afraid that he might be shot out of hand. We succeeded in preventing this extremity by dispatching a Petrograd comrade straight to the spot. He had the prisoner transferred to Moscow. Now I had no sure news of him. I was at the time, together with the Comintern delegates, watching the performance of an authentic Soviet mystery play in the court inside the old exchange. We saw the Paris Commune raise its red banners, then perish. We saw Jade assassinated, and the audience cried out in grief. We saw at last the joyful and victorious revolution and triumph over the world. The invisible presence of the persecuted for, my, for me spoilt the moment of triumph. In Moscow, I learned that Lenin and Kamenev had promised to see that Volin, now in, Cheka, now in a Cheka prison, would not die. Here we were with our discussions in the imperial halls of the Kremlin, while this model revolutionary was in a cell awaiting an uncertain end. After I left the Kremlin, I would visit another dissident, this time a Marxist, whose honesty and brilliance were of the first order. Yuri Os Osipovich Martov, co-founder with Plekhanov and Lenin of the Russian Social Democracy and the leader of Menshevism. He was campaigning for working class democracy, denouncing the excesses of the Cheka and the Lenin Trotsky mania for authority. He kept saying, just as though socialism could be instituted by decree and by shooting people in cellars. Lenin, who was fond of him, protected him against the Cheka though he quailed before Martov's sharp criticism. When I saw Martov, he was living on the brink of utter destitution in a little room. He struck me at the very first glance as being aware of his absolute incompatibility with the Bolsheviks. Although like them, he abs although like them, he was a Marxist. Highly cultured, uncompromising, and exceedingly brave. Puny, ailing, and limping a little, he had a slightly asymmetrical face, a high forehead, a mild and subtle gaze behind his spectacles, a fine mouth, a straggly beard, and an expression of gentle intelligence. 
Here was a man of scruple and scholarship, lacking the tough and robust revolutionary will that sweeps obstacles aside. His criticisms were opposite, but his general solutions verged on the utopian. Unless it returns to democracy, the revolution is lost. But how return to democracy, and what sort of democracy? All the same, I felt it to be quite unforgivable that a man of this caliber should be put into a position where it was impossible for him to give the revolution the whole wealth available in his thinking. You'll see, you'll see, he would tell me, free cooperation with the Bolsheviks is never possible. Just after I had returned to Petrograd, along with Raymond Lefebvre, Le Petit Ver Vergat, a French syndicalist, and Sasha Tubin, a frightful dramatic or a frightful drama took place there, which confirmed Martov's worst fears. I will summarize what happened, though the affair was shrouded in obscurity. The recently founded Finnish Communist Party emerged resentful and divided from a bloody defeat in 1918. Of its leaders, I knew Sirola and Kusinin, who did not seem particularly competent and had indeed acknowledged the commission of many errors. I had just published a little book by Kusinin on the whole business. He was a timid little man, circumspect and industrious. An opposition had been formed within the party in revulsion from the old parliamentary leadership that had been responsible for the defeat and which nowadays adhered to the Communist International. A party congress at Petrograd resulted in an oppositional majority against the Central Committee, which was supported by Zinoviev. The Comintern president had the congress proceeding stopped. One evening, a little later, some young Finnish students at a military school went along to a Central Committee meeting, meeting and, similar, some, some, fuck, and summarily shot Ivan Rakia and seven members of their own party. The press printed shameless lies, blaming the assassination on the whites. The, the accused openly justified their action, charging the Central Committee with treason and demanded to be sent to the front. A committee of three, including Rosmer and the Bulgarian Shablin, was set up by the International to examine the affair. I doubt it... I doubt if it ever met. The case was tried later in secret session by the Moscow Revolutionary Tribunal, Krilenko being the prosecutor. Its upshot was in some ways reasonable, in others monstrous. The guilty ones were formally condemned, but authorized to go off to the front. I do not know what actually happened to them. However, the leader of the opposition, Voito Laranta, who was considered as politically responsible, was first condemned to a period of imprisonment, and then in 1911, shot. So eight graves were dug in the field of Mars, and from the Winter Palace, where the eight red coffins were lying in state, covered with branches of pine, we marched them to their graves of heroes of the revolution. Raymond Lefebvre was due to speak and say what? He couldn't stop cursing, for God's sake again and again. On the platform, he denounced imperialism and the counter-revolution, of course. Soldiers and workers listened in silence, frowning. Traveling with Raymond Lefebvre, Le Petit, and Vergat was an old friend of mine, Sasha Tubin. During my incarceration in France, he had given me patient assistance in keeping up my clandestine correspondence with the outside world. Now, while we were traveling around Petrograd, I saw him gloomy and obsessed by somber forebodings. The four set off from Murmansk on a difficult route over the Arctic Sea, which was designed to pass through the naval blockade. Our international relations section had worked out this perilous itinerary. Embark in a fishing boat, sail well past the tip of the Finnish coast, and land at Vardo in Norway on ground that was free and safe. The four started on this route. In a hurry to attend a CGT Congress, they set out on a day of stormy weather and disappeared at sea. Possibly they were engulfed in the storm or perhaps a Finnish motorboat intercepted them and mowed them down. I knew that in Petrograd, spies had trailed out every step. Every day for a fortnight, Zinoviev asked me with mounting anxiety, have you any news of the French comrades? 
Around this disaster, unworthy legends were to grow. They are all lies. This would be in August or September 1920. While these four were drowning, a small-town adventurer was passing through the blockade and taking back to Paris diamonds he had purchased for a trifle in the black market of Odessa. <clears throat> the episode is worth recounting because, in this time of crisis, it demonstrates the scruples, even of the Cheka. I was eating with some delegates to the International, with an extremely skinny man, badly dressed, who carried on his scrawny neck the head of an unwell bird of prey, Skrypnik, an old Bolshevik and member of the Ukraine government, he who was due to commit suicide in 1934, falsely, of course, accused of nationalism, in reality because he was defending some Ukrainian intellectuals. We noticed someone approaching who wore pince-nez and whose generous reddish mustache decorated a ruddy face that I recognized immediately in amazement. Mauritius, ex-individualist propagandist in Paris, ex-pacifist propagandist during the war, and now ex-what? The High Court during the trial of Caillot and Malvi, one of the senior Paris police officers had suddenly referred to this agitator as one of our best agents. What are you doing here? I asked him. I'm a delegate for my group. I'm going to see Lenin. And what about what was said in the High Court? What do you say to that? A dirty trick by the police to discredit me. He was arrested, of course, and I had to defend him from the Cheka, who wanted to give him an extended acquaintance with agricultural activities in Siberia, so as to stop him taking back potentially useful information on the liaison service of the International. He was allowed to leave at his own risk, and he managed very well. I end this chapter in the aftermath of the Second Congress of the International, in September and October of 1920. I have the feeling that that this point marked a kind of boundary for us. The failure of the attack on Warsaw meant the defeat of the Russian Revolution in Central Europe, although no one saw it as, as such. At home, new dangers were waxing and we were on the road to catastrophes of which we had only a faint foreboding. By we, I mean the shrewdest comrades. The majority of the party was already blindly dependent on the schematism of official thinking. From October onwards, significant events, fated to pass unnoticed in the country at large, were together with the gentleness of a massing avalanche. I began to feel acutely, I am bound to say, this sense of a danger from inside, a danger within ourselves, in the very temper and character of victorious Bolshevism. I was continually racked by the contrast between the stared theory, or the stated theory, and the reality by the growth of intolerance and servility among many officials and their drive towards privilege. I remember a conversation I had with the People's Commissar for Food, Sirupa, a man with a splendid white beard and candid eyes. I had brought some French and Spanish comrades to him so that he could explain for our benefit the Soviet system of rationing and supply. He showed us beautifully drawn diagrams from which the ghastly famine and the immense black market had vanished without a trace. What about the black market? I asked him. It is of no importance at all, the old man replied. No doubt he was sincere, but he was a prisoner of his scheme, a captive of his system, within offices whose occupants obviously all primed him with lies. I was astounded. So this was how Zinoviev could believe in the imminence of proletarian revolution in Western Europe. Was this perhaps how Lenin could believe in the prospects of insurrection among the Eastern peoples? The wonderful lucidity of these great Marxists was beginning to be fuddled with a theoretical intoxication bordering on delusion, and they began to be enclosed within all the tricks and tomfooleries of servility. At meetings on the Petrograd front, I saw Zinoviev blush and bow his head in embarrassment at the imbecile flattery thrown in his face by young military careerists in their fresh shiny leather outfits. <clears throat> One of them kept shouting, we will win because we are under the command of our glorious leader, Comrade Zinoviev. A comrade who was a former convict had a sumptuously colored cover designed by one of the greatest Russian artists, which was intended to adorn one of Zinoviev's pamphlets. The artist and the ex-convict had combined to produce a masterpiece of obsequesc obsequesceness 
in which Zinoviev's Roman profile stood out like a proconsul in a cameo bordered by emblems. They brought it to the president of the inter international who thanked them cordially and, as soon as they were gone, called me to his side. It is the height of bad taste, Zinoviev told me in embarrassment, but I didn't want to hurt their feelings. I have a very small number printed and get a very simple cover designed instead. And another day he showed me a letter from Lenin that touched on the new bureaucracy, calling them all that Soviet riffraff. This atmosphere was often exacerbated because the perpetuation of the terror added an element of intolerable inhumanity. If the Bolshevik militants had not been so admirably straight, objective, disinterested, so determined to overcome one, any obstacle to accomplish their task, there would have been no hope. But on the contrary, their moral greatness and their intellectual standing inspired boundless confidence. I therefore realized that the notion of double duty was fundamental, and I was never to forget it. Socialism isn't only about defending against one's enemies, against the old world it is opposing. It also has to fight within itself against its own reactionary ferments. A revolution seems monolithic only from a distance. Close up, it can be compared to a torrent that violently sweeps along both the best and the worst at the same time and necessarily carries along some real counter-revolutionary currents. It is constrained to pick up the worn weapons of the old regime, and these arms are double-edged. In order to be properly served, it has to be put on guard against its own abuses, its own excesses, its own crimes, its own moments of reaction. It has a vital, vital need of criticism, therefore, of an opposition, and of the civic courage of those who are carrying it out. And in this connection, by 1920, we were already well short of the mark. A notable saying of Lenin's kept rising in my mind. It is a terrible misfortune that the honor of beginning the first socialist revolution should have befallen the most backward people in Europe. I quote from memory, Lenin said it on several occasions. Nevertheless, within the current situation of Europe, bloodstained, devastated, and in profound stupor, Bolshevism was, in my eyes, tremendously and visibly right, and marked a new point of departure in history. World capitalism, after its first suicidal war, was now clearly incapable either of organizing a positive peace or, what was equally evident, of deploying its fantastic technological progress to increase the prosperity, liberty, safety, and dignity of mankind. The revolution was therefore right as against capitalism, and we saw that the specter of future war would raise a question mark over the existence of civilization itself unless the social system of Europe was speedily transformed. The fearful Jacobinism of the Russian Revolution seemed to me to be quite unavoidable, as was the institution of a new revolutionary state, now in the process of disowning all its early promises. In this I saw an immense danger. The state seemed to me to be properly a weapon of war, not a means of organizing production. Overall, our achievements there hung a death sentence since for all of us, for our ideals, for the new justice that was proclaimed for our new collective death, or sorry, our new collective economy, still in its infancy, defeat would have brought a peremptory death and after that, who knows what. I thought of the revolution as a tremendous sacrifice that was required for the future's sake, and nothing seemed to me more essential than to sustain or rescue the spirit of liberty within it. In penning the above lines, I am no more than recapitulating my own writings of that period.